we are honored to have Dr. Glenn Kellogg provide our next lecture. Dr. Kellogg is currently Professor and Interim Chair of Medicinal Chemistry at the School of Pharmacy at Virginia Commonwealth University. Dr. Kellogg received a Bachelor Degree in Chemistry from the University of New Mexico and his PhD from the University of Arizona in 1985. After postdoctoral training at Northwestern University, he joined the Medicinal Chemistry Group at VCU in 1988. Dr. Kellogg's expertise is in the area of computational chemistry. I know you will enjoy today's lecture. Hello, uh, my name is Glenn Kellogg and I'm here to talk to you about molecular modeling and drug discovery and design. Uh, I'm from the Department of Medicinal Chemistry at Virginia Commonwealth University and I've been working in this area for uh, nearly 30 years. My goal here is to give you a little bit of the background and, and how it works behind it and then give you some leading references and uh, ideas that you can take forward into your research. So, uh, let's start with the simple, the simple idea of theories, models, and predictions. A theory is something that relies on first principles to make predictions. While, mod while models are more empirical in nature, and they will include known data and fitting it to, to a model. Both can be used to predict properties, and that's, that's a key thing, is that properties are what we're interested in because that enables us to talk about drug discovery, uh, drug activity, uh, and so forth. If we have a more basic understanding, which means of the theory, we can improve our theory and we can get better predictions. If we have more experimental data, we can get better models, and that also leads to better predictions. So what is a molecular model? Well, it is just about any time you try and represent a molecule, because they're too tiny for us to see, we try to draw them, we try and uh, make representations of them that show how, what their shape is and so forth. And even X-ray crystal structures are models of molecules. So anytime we try and use some sort of visualization, we've created a molecular model. So what properties are we talking about? Well, there are molecular properties, and those are properties that reside on a single molecule. Uh, and some of these, which may or may not be important for, for drug discovery, would be like the boiling point of a molecule, its melting point, its log P, its molecular weight, molar reactivity, the highest occupied molecular orbital energy, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's many, many of these. Structure is a molecular property. Now, some of these might be atomistic. And what does atomistic mean? Well, atomistic means that it can be predicted, it can be predicted just from the atoms involved. So what is the example of that? Well, one would be molecular weight. We can predict the uh, molecular weight of molecule exactly by knowing the, what the uh, chemical formula of the molecule is and what the atomic weights are. Other of these, like the HOMO energy or so forth, would be very difficult to predict atomistically. So the other type of properties are what I'm going to call intermolecular. And those are derived from the interaction of two molecules. And that would like be binding constants, free energy of binding, anything like that. And these are the sort of things that lead us to drug activity because it's, it's, the, it's the interaction between two molecules that lead to a, uh, some sort of biological effect. Now these are not likely to be atomistic, although some aspects of that might show up. There are a number of drug discovery and drug design paradigms, and it turns out that they kind of follow those two patterns of single properties and intermolecular properties. So the first paradigm is called ligand-based drug discovery, and that uses the properties of the molecules themselves, and then from those we can develop models of activity, and we can assist in designing new active lead compounds, clinical candidates, and ultimately lead to, to new drugs. Uh, the important part of this is that we could do this in the absence of knowing what the receptor is. We would just do it based on what the molecules themselves are telling us in terms of their activities. The other paradigm is structure-based drug discovery, and that uses the properties and structures of molecules as they're bound to their receptors. And from that, we can identify the molecular 
features that are ideal for binding and by inference then ideal for activity. This is actually the root of what's called the lock and key model for how for uh, for drug discovery that every every lock which is like a protein or receptor has a key which is the ideal molecule. So uh, what kind of techniques do we have for molecular modeling? Well there are some that are, are related to building structures and structures means structures of small molecules, structures of proteins, structures of intramolecular interactions. I'm going to go through these in variable level of detail. The first one is quantum mechanics. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute but that's this, the uh, Hamiltonian and so forth that you probably saw in maybe a physical chemistry course or perhaps you were afraid of and didn't take a physical chemistry course but it's it's the hardcore uh, quantum mechanics approach to uh, to molecular structure. Uh, the next level is what we call molecular mechanics and this includes things like MD which is a sh shorthand notation for molecular dynamics. And another uh, model which is uh, can be used to develop the uh, three-dimensional structures of molecules is called homology or comparative modeling and that's a model where we we look at the structure of known molecules and use those to predict the structure of unknown molecules or proteins. We're also going to talk about a couple ligand-based methods uh, for drug, drug more or less design and not so much drug discovery uh, and we will use that for uh, uh, we'll use two, two types of uh, methods there, uh, QSAR and its, uh, and its offshoot 3D QSAR and we'll look at virtual screening uh, of databases where we have a template. We have a known molecule and we're looking for something similar to it. Uh, then we'll move on and talk about structure based methods. Uh, again we can use a virtual screening approach but in this case we use the, the structure of the target, the binding site, as the, as the template to try and determine an a, a ideal molecule to match it. And we'll talk about docking and scoring. So quantum mechanics, well that's the, the Hamiltonian H psi equals E psi where psi is the, is the uh, Schrodinger equation. Uh, there is um, much that's good and important about this. We can determine electronic structure, we can determine electronic properties. Uh, we can determine electro-orbitals, ionization energies, etc. But on the other hand, because we're interested in fairly large molecules, especially if we're interested in proteins, uh, that make the QM methods almost impossible. They're just not enough computer power available for us to use it. So it's impossible for proteins and very, very likely impractical for larger drug molecules if you want to do if you want any level of speed, like if you're trying to screen a large number of molecules. However, I must say that as the, the speed and cost of computers keeps improving, uh, we are gradually moving more and more towards a QM based methodology for drug discovery. So let's talk more about molecular mechanics. The very basic idea of molecular mechanics is that we treat molecules as physical entities, as in things you can actually feel, touch, and hold and they are therefore governed by the conventional, which means the non-quantum, Newtonian laws of physics. So let's say we want to calculate the energy of a molecule. Well, there are, right, there are a variety of ways to do that. We could go back to what you probably saw in freshman chemistry where you count how many double bonds it has, how many single bonds it has, and add it all up and get some sort of energy. But another way to do that, which is useful for our goals, is to take the total energy molecule and divide it into the different types of, of uh, motions and uh, instabilities that a molecule might have. So we'll have a, stre a stretching energy, we'll have a bending energy, an OOP which means out of plane, I'll talk more about that in a minute. We have torsion energies, van der Waals energies, and coulombic energies. In summary, the total energy of molecules are some of the various energy terms that represent the various stresses and strains on that molecule. So let's start with a stretch. Um, we have a diatomic molecule here. Uh, two, the two atoms are represented by the simplest physical en entity we can think of, 
atom, uh, atoms are going to be represented by just balls, like billiard balls or golf balls or whatever you want. And the distance between them is given by R. And is, it's drawn here, R is a stick representing the distance between them. But we, we, we know a little bit more about molecules than that. We know that molecules are not rigid, that there's various motions on them. In fact, a better representation would be to put a spring between those two, those two atoms, between those two balls. And if we do that, we can use the, we can use the Hooke's law, as represented here in the bottom, as, a, um, as an equation that represents the energy of the spring as a function of distance between the atoms. And that's what's shown by this graph here. Hooke's law is actually has an r squared term in it such that, such that it gives a parabolic representation of energy. So at the, the lowest energy part, right down here at the bottom, is when the, sp the spring is at rest. And if you try and stretch a spring, make it longer, you're going to, it's going to cost you energy. And if you try and compress a spring to try and make it shorter, it's also going to cost you energy. So we can represent the, the force between two atoms in terms of how, how much work or energy it would take to move that distance in terms of Hooke's Law. Now what's, what makes Hooke's Law especially useful for this is that this is very, very simple mathematics. It's just a square term. And we can do that on a computer lightning fast. Now let's change over to a, a triatomic molecule. We again have three balls represented here. And we have two sticks. But now we have a new feature. We have an angle between those two bonds. And we could go through the process of using sines and cosines to calculate energies, but a trick was developed quite a long while ago to make this simpler. Why don't we pretend there's another spring, a fake spring, between those two atoms. And now we can use Hooke's Law again. We can use Hooke's Law to represent the change in the angle theta as a function of distance, and that would give us Again, the very simple mathematics we, we really are craving in order to make this very fast. Now, I mentioned the outer plane earlier. That is what happens when we have four atoms. Three of them will automatically be in a plane, because that's the definition of a plane, is any three points in space represent a plane. And a fourth is either in that plane or out of that plane. That's what OOP means, out of plane. Uh, and there would be an energy associated with that. Again, we could use fairly complicated trigonometry to get the answer, but the simple pragmatic approach is to measure the distance between the plane and that atom as d, and again use a simple Hooke's Law term to calculate the energy of that. Lastly, in terms of these sorts of terms is what's called the torsion angle. The torsion angle is the, uh, is the uh, rotation of these two atoms with respect to these two atoms. So it swings around this, this uh, bond here. Now, if you look at this, it first may seem counterintuitive, but none of, the, none of the bond lengths have changed, and none of, the actual three at, none of the actual three atom angles have changed. We're only changing, the, we're only changing this angle here. And the the importance of this is that that changes the shape of the molecule a tremendous amount, having it stretched out like this or compressed like this changes the shape of the molecule a tremendous amount. Unfortunately, we've run out of tricks that we can use to uh, simplify the math and we we're stuck with this fairly complicated equation to calculate the energy of a torsion angle. Now, the torsion angle turns out to be important because it affects the shape of the molecules I mentioned. And the shape of the molecule leads us to worrying about what is the, what is the level of interaction between two atoms. And this gives us what's called the Van der Waals term or the London force term or there's a variety of other names that are used. So the Van der Waals, in simple, in simple terms, and this is not precisely physically uh, 
what this is not precisely what a physicist would say, but if what is happening is there's an attraction between the nucleus on one and the electrons on another. And this causes the electron cloud to get pushed around a little bit so that it tries to, tries to uh, optimize that interaction. So there's a little bit of push and a little bit of pull here, so it, it influences each other. And at a distance where the electron cloud of one is optimally placed near the, the uh, nucleus of the other and vice versa, that is called the van der Waals distance. And they, and they are just, just touching each other. So this little animation sort of shows how that happens. And uh, the optimum distance is called the van der Waals distance. This graph shows what it looks like mathematically. The important thing I said about the, uh, the torsion angle really comes into play because there's nothing in anything we've shown you so far that present, prevents two atoms from actually passing through each other. And this is one of the purposes of what's called the van der Waals term, and that's EVDW. In simple terms, and this, is, this isn't physicist approved, uh, the, the, the van der Waals term arises because, because two atoms each have positively charged nuclei and negatively charged electrons, and there's a little bit of attraction between the positively charged nucleus of one and the negative char negatively charged electrons of the other, and it causes a, an attraction force and eventually reach a point down here at the bottom where they are just touching each other, perfect kissing distance we might say, and that is what's called the van der Waals distance or the van, and that's what the van der Waals radius for each atom is derived from. So this graph shows the energy of this as a function of distance. The lowest energy here is where the two uh, the two atoms are just in this perfect kissing position here but if if I pull them apart from each other ultimately we're going to it's going to take a little bit of energy to pull them apart and it's going to reach a point at infinite distance where there's no energy uh, attraction or repulsion between the two molecules and that's and that's as you might expect as they get farther and farther away from each other they uh, the energy dissipates. However, and this is the m more important part, is if you try and push them too close to each other, the energy rises very rapidly until it reaches a point where it's extremely repulsive because we're trying to, cr we're trying to smash those two, two nuclei together or smash the electrons together. And that is what, of course, prevents the two atoms from touching each other. The, the term the mathematical term for the van der Waals force is shown here, and this is also called the Leonard Jones term, and it just is a simple mathematical function that has a, tw a power of 12 and a power of 6, representing the, uh, the distances between the atoms, and uh, this mathematical function gives the shape as shown here. Now the next term, the Coulombic term, is a, ch is a charge-based term which represents the uh, electrostatic energy between two atoms. And let's say we have one atom that's got a Q1 charge and the other atom has a Q2 charge. Uh, Coulombic energy is given as this. Now if those two atoms are of the same charge, that's a repulsive force and they're going to push away from each other. And if they're of, this, of different sign, uh, they're, it's an attractive force and they're going to pull towards each other. Now where do the charges on these atoms come from? You know, aren't molecules neutral? Why are there charges? Well, molecules are neutral, but there are differences in electronegativity between atoms. As you know, the electronegativity increases to the right and increases as you move up the periodic table, so more electronegative atoms have a tendency to be far to the right or, or at the top of the periodic table. So using those, those terms, the electronegativity terms, and, and factoring in a little bit of polarization energy, each atom generates a, or each, each atom possesses a partial charge that is, is relative to the other uh, atoms in the molecule. So on the left here, we have just a simple benzene molecule, and you see that the carbons are a little bit electronegative with minus 0.0622, but each of the hydrogens is, is a little bit electropositive with plus 0.0622. 
Altogether, when we add up all these terms, of course, the total is zero. The molecule is neutral, but each of the atoms have a partial charge. Now, as we change the type of molecule into something more complicated, we find, for example, in this molecule that the, the, the partial charge on the carbons reaches its maximum at the meta position relative to the other carbons because the methyl methoxy carbonyl group is electron withdrawing. And here, the, since the means are electron releasing, the, 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 the carbon charge, re, the C charge, re, reaches its maximum at the ortho and para positions here and here. Okay, so when we put all this together, we have what's called the force field. And that describes how to calculate the potential energy of a molecule. The bond lengths, the bond angles, the atomic radii, all those things we talked about are taken from high resolution crystal structures of small molecules and from proteins. So we, we know what the, an ideal carbon-carbon bond length is, what an ideal carbon-hydrogen bond length is, and so forth, and we use that to help calibrate our terms. And the force constants for Hooke's law, the stretches and the bends, are taken from infrared and similar experiments. So we, we experimentally calibrate the functions, the mathematical functions we, we have in our, in our force field. So we put this all together. When we have information for every conceivable sort of uh, bond and angle and uh, interaction, we would have a force field that could calculate, in principle, the energy of any molecule. Now, that, that is useful in itself, but it becomes more useful because we can use it to predict the energy of a molecule. And that's what's called optimization or minimization. So there are two terms, energy minimization and structure optimization. They are used somewhat interchangeably. It's a simultaneous process. By definition, the most optimal structure is the one that has the lowest energy. So it means that if we can keep getting a lower energy structure, we must be getting a more optimal structure. And also by definition, uh, these are performed at zero degrees Kelvin in vacuum. So there's, we're limiting some other competing, uh, uh, competing uh, energy terms. Now, there are all kinds of permutations on the algorithms, and I'm not going to talk about the algorithms. They're mostly to increase the speed and increase the ability to guess ahead. The basic idea of all the structure optimization protocols is that if the energy is, de is decreasing, then the structure is improving. So as long as the energy is going down, we're getting a better and better structure. Unfortunately, however, it's not quite so simple. There are something called uh, local minima and global minima. So, for example, this is uh, a naive representation of a cyclohexane drawn as a, as a hexagon. Uh, we all know that's not really true. It actually exists in two forms, uh, the boat form and the chair form. And uh, that affects the energy. So. Uh, if it's a simple structure, there'll be a starting point of our minimization. We're going to take a, a incorrect structure and try and create a correct structure by minimizing the energy. So as the energy is going down here, we're getting a better and better and better and better structure until we reach a minimum. Ideally, there'd be only one minimum, but in reality, there can be more than one or there can be many of them. So going back to our cyclohexane here, let's say we have a badly drawn cyclohexane and we uh, minimize our energy, minimize our energy, and then we reach this point here, this local minimum, which happens to correspond, unfortunately, to the boat form of cyclohexane. How do we get down here? Well, because of the rules that I described on the previous slide, we can't because the rule is that if the energy is going down, we must be doing the right thing. There is no way to go from here to here by only going down. We have to actually go up a little bit and then back down. So this is what's called local minimum. The absolute correct structure is at the global minimum. And that would be, in this case, would be the, the chair form of cyclohexane. So how do we get out of these local minima? Well, two major approaches and a variety of other approaches, but the two major approaches are one to do an exhaustive search. 
we would calculate the energies of all the possibilities and then pick the one that has lowest energy. That, in principle, should always work. And the one that has lowest energy would be the one that's at the global minimum. So, for example, uh, we could vary the torsion angles of rotatable bonds, and I'll show an example on that in the next slide. If we rotate our, our rotatable bonds by about 15 degrees each, each turn, uh, the number of structures we would have to calculate would be 24 to the n, where n is the number of bonds we have to rotate. Now, if n is 1 or 2 or 3, it's not a big deal. Uh, we can calculate a few hundred or a few thousand structures without any problem at all, but if n gets up to be 10, 12, 15, or something like that, and then we're talking about billions or more structures, in which case it's not, long, not going to be a simple mathematical problem, but actually a much more complicated problem. So the other approach is what's called molecular dynamics. In, in molecular dynamics, we add some heat. Remember I said it was at zero degrees Kelvin, but now we would add some heat in. We'd add some time and let the molecule kind of shake its way out of this local minimum. And that's what you would do with larger molecules. So first, looking at uh, the exhaustive search approach, here's a long straight molecule, uh, but it has a variety of rotatable bonds, and we may or may not have it at the optimum uh, conformation. So uh, let's look at these bonds. Well, what, what would happen if we rotate around this bond? Well, this would spin the fluorine around, and it wouldn't change anything. So that it may be rot it might be rotatable, but it doesn't change the structure at all. So that one's really not very interesting. What about this one? Well, in this case, we would, we would take that, uh, the benzene ring to the left there and spin it in and out of the plane so that by rotating around this bond, we would, ch we would change its energy somewhat. Now what about this one? Well, this one would swing that whole group to the left around and change the structure by quite a bit. And this one would do a similar sort of thing, as with this, as with this, as with this. All those things would be changing the structure of the molecule. What about this one? Well, in this case, we would swing that methyl group there at the end around like a propeller, and yes, that would change the structure, but not as significant as some of the other ones. What about this one? What if we spin this one around? Well, it depends on what detail you're interested in. If it's a, if you're really interested in like where the electron pair is on an NH2 group, then spinning this around would change its structure by quite a bit because the electron pair would spin around. As you know, it's the NH2 is a, is like a two, uh, a two-legged stool. So we would we would change the structure. What about spinning around here? Well, maybe if you're really interested in where those three hydrogens are on the methyl, that might cause a structure change, but that's probably not that important. So in this particular case, we have between seven and nine rotatable bonds, depending on which ones you consider important. The seven would be the green ones, and the eighth and ninth would be the orange and yellow ones. Here's molecular dynamics. It's a, it's a whole major topic, so I'm just going to touch on it with this one slide. But the idea is you take a molecule, you put it ideally in a box of solvent as shown down here on the lower right. And you add some heat to the molecule and it heats up, starts moving around a little bit, and you can uh, perhaps make it change its conformation depending on how much heat you add, how long you let it go, and so forth. But the idea is if you heat it up and cool it down, heat it up and cool it down a number of times, you might find it in a different conformation that's energetically better than the one you started in. Okay, I'm going to change topics now to, uh, to uh, ligand-based drug discovery. Now we've kind of gone over all the approaches we might use in order to build molecules. Now let's think about how we can relate this, this, the structure of molecules to their activities. And QSCR is a uh, technique developed in the late 60s by uh, Corwin Hanch and Tujeo Fujita. Uh, and really, it's kind of a really simple idea. Activity is a function of structure. Uh, it seems obvious now, but uh, it's not so obvious because you have to find a way to represent structure in a meaningful and mathematically accessible way. Electromechanics 
as we discussed previously, gives us access to a number of mathematical constructs that relate to structure. And uh, those are all useful, but they're all physics. Remember what I said when we started molecular mechanics is that we're trying to treat our chemicals as being physical, physical objects. So where's the chemistry? And that's where, and that's where QSR is important is because it, it allows us to add some chemistry. So in the hansch fujita analysis, uh, they focused on molecular properties more than structure descriptors. They used the pi constant, which is, a, the log, which is related to the log p for a one octanol water uh, uh, mixture or uh, layers. And uh, that's commonly called hydrophobicity. They looked at the Hammond sigma for electronic effects and the TAF ES uh, parameter for steric effects. And the equation they came up with, shown in the middle here, log of 1 over IC50 is equal to some constant A times pi plus some constant B times sigma and plus some constant C times the, the TAF parameter plus D. And they found that they could predict the IC50 of a variety of molecules reasonably well if they were able to, if they were able to uh, calibrate their function with a, with a good collection of known structures. But all the descriptors they used are empirical. They're all based on measurements of other molecules. And they, there aren't any descriptors that describe or explain the molecular structure and shape of molecules. So that uh, a, 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 an arms race of sorts developed in order to come up with more descriptors. So there's the first group here, which are the the physical chemical properties, which are the empirical ones, uh, in addition to the hash fujita parameters, uh, people found the melting point was sometimes useful, solubility was useful. Uh, structure was used uh, in a couple simple ways. One is the molecular weight, a larger molecule will behave differently than a smaller molecule. But also you could count the number of hydrogen bond donors, the number of hydrogen bond acceptors, and so forth, and use that as a, as a descriptor. Uh, people looked into using quantum mechanical terms like the, the highest occupied molecular orbital energy and, and related. And then uh, another whole branch came out of this called uh, topographical or graph theory descriptors. For example, the Keir and Hall set w was used. And this led to what, which is really a, a simple idea, a QSAR table. So. On the left here, our left column are the compounds, and we'll just call them A, B, C, D, or whatever. Uh, and their, their biological, measured biological activities are Y, A, Y, B, Y, C, Y, D. And the descriptor 1, descriptor 2, descriptor 3, descriptor 4 has values for each of these. Now, some of these would be log P. Some of these might be the Kieran Hall descriptors. They could be homo energies, or any number of things are, are added here as our descriptors. And uh, then we try and solve this equation of why the activity is equal to a function of the descriptor 1, descriptor 2, descriptor 3, and so forth, in order to come up with an equation that leads us to be able to predict the activity of A, B, C, D, etc. So the more data you put into your QSAR, the better your predictions will be. This is the, ba this is the basis of the what's called one-dimensional, sometimes two-dimensional QSIR. So uh, the trick was, of course, having uh, activity data for, for a large number of molecules, being able to collect or, or, or calculate descriptors for each of those molecules, and uh, then do some sort of statistical modeling in order to, in order to create a, uh, a, a QSAR, a QSAR equation. And you can use multilinear regression, partially squares, genetic algorithms, simulated annealing, neural networks, support vector machines, and a number of other approaches to create this, this equation. Now, if, you're, if your equation is, if your equation you create from your known data is good, then you're in a position where you can actually start predicting the results for unknown molecules. But they have to be more or less in the same set of molecules that you're looking at. So you can't jump from a, 
a series of molecules that are active at one active at one receptor with one kind of one sort of core uh, template or, 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 or core template or core structure and then throw in another completely different thing because those sort of descriptors are not going to work as well. So this led to a different approach which was called uh, 3D QSAR in which we represented molecules not by their molecular properties but by their shape and their shape was represented as fields. So in this particular this particular paradigm you would take a molecule shown here put it in a three-dimensional box of grid points and it's represented by all these little dots all over the place and each of those grid points would represent sort of a, a little test molecule or test atom that would measure its feelings towards the molecule so if this test atom was sitting here right root right close to this OH group it would feel that, hey, I'm near an OH group and I behave this way. But if you're if it's sitting over here, it would not feel much of anything because it's over in the corner of the box. It wouldn't give much of a response at all. So this was the basis of the first three QSR technique, which is called CUNFA, and that included ways to calculate two types of fields. One was a steric field, which is used using the van der Waals potential, and the second was an electrostatic field using the coulombic potential. So it looks something like this. Uh, the coulombic term uh, would sample each point in space with respect to electrostatic charge, basically using the coulombic equation I showed you earlier. And uh, that would represent the charge effect of that molecule throughout space. And it would look something like this. The steric field, on the other hand, is using the van der, Waals, van der Waals term or the Leonard Jones potential term, which I showed, and that drops off really rapidly once you're outside the, outside the, the, van, der, uh, outside the van der Waals radius of an atom, so it kind of has this almost shrink wrap look to it. So it tells you when you're inside the molecule, and it tells you when you're outside the molecule, and doesn't have much in between. And that's why it looks, this looks like a molecule that's been shrink wrapped. And again, it's done the same way. You just use this equation over all, it uses this equation over all space with a set of grid points. So if you do that, we can uh, calculate a QSAR. In this case, we have our compounds like before. We have our biological activities like before. But instead of descriptor D1, D2, D3 like I had before, we have the value of the steric field at 0.111 or uh, 0.112 or whatever, just a, a, um, a point in space, and we would fill in this table with all the points in space. So instead of there being just 10 or 12 descriptors, we will have th hundreds to thousands of descriptors, each representing the value of the uh, of a grid point in space. And we would solve it again as y if the activity is a function of these points in space. And the activity would again be a function of, of those points in space. And this, uh, this is the basis of 3D QSAR. And it's turned out to be a, a rather, rather useful way to look at structures. Now what, are the, what can we do with that? Well, we can use statistics to drive a model of activity as a function of those points in space. We have to use cross-validation, and I'll show you that in just a minute. Uh, that enables us to uh, determine the internal predictiveness of the model, and then we will validate our model with an external test set to make sure that it's true, and uh, we can also learn the spatial relationships by making special maps uh, of activity to learn where in space and where on a molecule is the most likely place to change to change to ch most likely place to modify the molecule to change its activity. So just briefly cross validation in, in case you haven't seen this term before because we are using so many descriptors in 3D QSAR we can't rely on a standard R squared to give us much useful information. In fact R squared on 3D QSAR is always 
very high, like 0.9 to 0.99. So we have to do cross-validation. So what cross-validation is, is that we'll, let's say we have 26 molecules in our data set, A through Z, and we want to calculate the cross-validation or the cross-validated R squared, which is also called the Q squared for this molecule. What we would do first is we take, we leave number A out, we wouldn't, we would leave it out of the model, and would use B through Z to calculate a model for the activity. And from that model, we would predict A. And then we would do it again by leaving B out or leaving C out. And this is why it's sometimes called leave one out. So all those predictions for A through Z would then be compared against the actual value, the actual measured values for that in order to calculate what's called the Q squared. So the better the Q squared means the better the model is at predicting uh, the structure, uh, predicting the activity of the structures in the data set. And the other advantage of 3D QSR is that we don't have to use a limited number of, of uh, descriptors. We can use many different sorts of fields. We can use the hydrophobic fields, we can use uh, topological fields, and a variety of things. And when you have a collection of fields like this, it enables you to fine-tune your, your 3D QSAR for the type of molecules you have. Like if you know your molecules are, are correlating pretty high with, with hydrophobicity, you would use a hydrophobic field in order to differentiate that. So uh, I want to make a couple points here. Uh, one is that Q squared, the, the statistical measure of the field, is an important factor, but you also need to think about the interpretation. If you're using fields that are uh, difficult to understand, that's not going to help you design new compounds. Because the, 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 bottom, the bottom line is that we're doing all this because we want to design new compounds with new, new and improved activities. And so for example, the hydrophobic field type is based on chemistry, and it's not based on physics. It might have more chemical intuition than, than just the steric or electrostatic fields. So it's important to consider how interpretable it is in addition to how good the statistics are. So there's pros and cons of using 3D QSAR. Uh, one advantage, and I alluded to this, but let's talk about it a little more detail. Because these property fields are independent of the specific backbone structure of the molecules, we don't have to stick with the same backbone. We don't have to use the same template for the molecule. We can actually move from one to another, and this is what's called scaffold hopping. That allows us to expand our, our data set to a variety of related molecules, not just close families. We can learn which part of the molecules are good for activity or bad for activity, and that gives us a clue on how to design appropriate analogs. And we can tailor our fields to the characteristics of the data set. But the cons are is that we have to have, because it's a, because it's a ligand-based method, we're not paying any attention. We don't know, any, usually don't know anything about the, the structure of the receptor that it's, or, or uh, enzyme it's binding to. We have to presume what we know what the active conformation is. And there quite often can be a large number of poses for a molecule or shapes or conformations for a molecule that are very similar. And it requires us to be able to take a collection of molecules and overlap them in a way that they again, that we presume that they are going to be binding at the active site. And the way to start that is if you create a pharmacophore. A pharmacophore would be the collection of most important, uh, most important features of the molecule. This can be sometimes non-intuitive because it's, uh, it's difficult to say what the most important part of the molecule is if you don't know anything about how it binds. But if you have, some, if you have a good activity on a rigid analog, that can really help. And lastly, and I think this is an important point, which, which I sort of mentioned is already, is that chemistry can easily be lost if you focus too much on the statistics. And that's, that's not the point. The product of any sort of molecular modeling ac exercise is to develop new molecules, not statistics. Okay, so most computational chemistry, and especially in medicinal chemistry, is dressed up QSAR. The key thing of QSAR was that the, 
binding efficacy and all those things can be correlated with structure. So uh, that is the basis of nearly everything else that happens in, 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 in drug discovery and drug design is really it's a form of QSAR. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, ligand structure based uh, pharma, uh, pharmacophore database searches and target based searches. And I'm going to talk about docking and scoring as well. And I should also point out there's a, a uh, method from uh, Jorgensen's group that uh, uses a linear response method for calculating free energy and binding that is surprisingly QSAR-like. So virtual screening uh, is a terminology that's used to discover molecules. Uh, it's really maybe where how we how we're going to make QSAR achieve the goals that we want it to have. So virtual screening, uh, the terminology was uh, came out of uh, Vertex, uh, with Pat Walters, Matt Stahl, and Mark Murko, uh, and late late 1990s. And definition is that it's the use of a high performance computing method to analyze large databases of chemical compounds in order to identify possible candidates. So why would you, we do that? Well, it's a filter. We can reduce the size of a chemical library to do physical screening very easily from millions to thousands. Uh, no one wants to be in the lab screening a million compounds, but you might convince them to look at a few hundred. It will increase the likelihood of finding good compounds. So if we throw away all the ones that just aren't going to work and just look at the ones that might work, we would get better hit rates. If, if, you, look, if you screen a library of a million compounds without doing any sort of pre-screening, uh, your, your likelihood of getting anything worthwhile is far less than 1%. If you do some good virtual screening, you can get that up to 5 or 10%. So it's, it's worth doing. We can uh, perform some sort of analysis before an assay is even established. And probably the most interesting and cool thing is that you can actually figure out what's worth making before you, before you make it. Now, uh, we targets out there are increasing rapidly. There's many, many new targets every year. And we're going to need more and more computational methods in order to survey all those targets. So there's a variety of uh, sources of small molecule structures. Uh, the CZ CCDC, which is a Cambridge Structural Database, has, a, has a, 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 a database of small molecules. The NCI has about a half million compounds that you can look at. And in some of those, they'll even make it available for testing in your lab. Uh, there's a PubChem li library. And there's a library, a virtual library called Zinc, uh, which comes out of, uh, comes out of uh, UCSF uh, and has 30 million. It grows by the day. It could be more today. I don't know. Uh, lots of compounds where they give you the structure and they tell you how to buy it. But perhaps most importantly for, uh, for a lot of people is that the pharmaceutical companies have large private libraries of compounds that have been part of previous projects. When they are doing a cancer study and the compound doesn't work, they don't throw it away. They keep it because you never know what it could be useful for something else later. And so those are the crown jewels of every, every drug company. When one drug company buys another drug company, one of the things they're after is their library of compounds. So let's use our 3D databases in two different ways. This is the first way. That's the ligand-based method. Let's say our competitor, or a drug company, our competitor has an active compound, and they're making billions on it. We want to see if we can get something in the same, in the same, uh, uh, the same space that will allow us to make billions, too. So we take our, our competitor's compound. We find out what its structure is and we determine a pharmacophore. And by using the, the spatial arrangement of the components of the pharmacophore, we can form a query, and then we can apply our query to a database and look for hits, and then, then we go on to the chemist. We'll show it to the chemist and see if he can make leads and uh, analogs and so forth. So here's an example of that. Molecule up here in the upper left 
is our reference molecule, our competitor has this and they're just killing us in the marketplace. We uh, look at it and we say, okay, it's, we think it's hot because it's got this hydrophobic ring up here in the left, the cyclohexyl ring. Uh, we like this heterocycle here, which is, and we like this uh, oxygen over here. So those are going to be our three pharmacophore points, here, here, and here. Uh, and uh, the green ones are the hydrophobic, hydrophobic groups, the blue are H-bond acceptors, and the yellow are aromatics. And this is a representation of this in terms of those three data, uh, those three pharmacophore points. We measure the distance between them because that's important. It's nearly seven angstroms between these two, nearly seven between these two, and about three between these two. And that take away the molecule and we're left with this. We expand out the distances a little bit because we, we know that it's a little flexible and doesn't need to be that tight. And we use this as our, as our query. Now, we take this query and apply it to our database. We look at this, we look at this molecule. Well, it's got the same features. It's got a green one, a yellow one, and a blue one, but the distances are all wrong, so we'll throw it away. We look at this one. The distances are wrong. And it's got the wrong features. We're going to throw this one away. But here, we look at this molecule. It's got the distances. It's got the, the, uh, the features. And this is, a potential, this is a potential molecule that might lead us to a competitive molecule in this, in this, uh, in this space. Now, when our competitor patented this, this uh, molecule, they patented the molecule, not the pharmacophore. They can't patent a pharmacophore. So if we could come up with a molecule that has a different structure, but still has the same pharmacophore, we are free to develop it. And that's what's shown here. Now the second way we can do this is to use uh, 3D, deba 3D databases in a structure-based way. We will take the active site of a, of a protein or, or a protein or a receptor or enzyme or whatever, and use that to determine what we think the pharmacophore should be. And again, we'll then create a query, we'll apply the query to our database to drive hits, and then we'll have our chemists look at those and see if we can make some lead compounds. Now this is a kind of contrived example, but this is the methotrexate binding site here. And uh, there's a feature on the, on the binding site shown here, which is a, uh, which is a which is an acceptor, that means our ideal molecule should be a donor. Here, this feature on the on the far, on the binding site is a uh, is aromatic, so we want to try and get a pi pi stacking thing going here, and we will uh, look for something that also has an aromatic group in this region of space. Now, these these two features on the molecule on the, this molecule here are. Uh, donors, which means we want to have acceptors on our molecule. So uh, let's see what we get. Well, surprisingly enough, the, uh, the compound that matches the best to the methotrexate binding site is methotrexate, uh, which, like I said, it's contrived. Uh, but we have, it shows the features that we want. So first, we needed something that was an acceptor and a donor, and that's shown, that's shown as this. Here's our, here's our donor. Because the, the, the site has an acceptor, we want a donor. We wanted to have something that was uh, aromatic. There's a big, nice aromatic ring here in the middle. And we also wanted to have a, um, a couple acceptors, uh, which are shown as here and here. So surprisingly enough, methotrexate binds at the methotrexate binding site. But that's the principle behind it. The principle is that you look at an active site, find the features of the molecule that would fit most ideally, and then do a database search to find molecules that match those features. Okay, we're going to move on a little bit now into docking and scoring. That's the next phase of, of drug discovery. If you find a collection of molecules that meet the pharmacophore requirements, the next thing you want to do is if, if you do have a structure of your protein that you are going to try and dock to or bind to, you would want to see if you, how well you can, 
how well you can bind your putative ligands into that molecule. So uh, there's two steps, docking and scoring. They're, they're used together, but they are two separate steps. The first step is bringing together the models of our receptor and our ligands in three dimensions. This turns out to be pretty easy. There are lots of ways to do this. Uh, many algorithms are available. So it's not a, that's not a problem. The hard part is to score the interactions, which means predict how well those molecules are going to bind and what their activity will be and have it be relatively uh, accurate and be able to relate different molecules with respect to other molecules, i.e. rank them. So uh, there are many, me many methods of docking algorithms uh, available. I, this lists uh, seven of them or so. Uh, I point out we wrote a chapter that is in uh, Berger's Medicinal Chemistry, uh, the more or less the Bible of Medicinal Chemists, and you can look at that. I'm not going to go into, uh, I don't have time to do all these, so I'm just going to talk about this, the first one, the simplest one, briefly. But if you're curious about the other methods, look in this chapter. So there's point complementarity, which I'm going to talk about. There's approaches based on distance geometry, which is used in the DOC method that um, uh, the Kuntz group has developed. Uh, there's exhaustive and systematic methods. Uh, there's something called incremental co construction, which is part of the program called FlexX. Uh, there's ways to use molecular dynamics in this. Uh, there's some genetic algorithm methods. Uh, and that's, those are used both in the GOLD program and in the AutoDoc program. And uh, there, there's a combination methods where you use different approaches, or you have a consensus where you use multiple approaches and find the one that most agreed to. So just briefly, point complementarity. And this, this, is a, this is a very old approach because it requires actually rigid structures. So if we have a, uh, our, molecule, uh, our, our molecule here, we will turn it into a, a set of points and uh, use those points in space. And the, the pluses are where it's uh, positively, uh, positively charged or a donor. The, the minuses are where it's an acceptor. And the O's are where it's hydrophobic. We'd match that to our receptor, which is shown here, which has the same sort of thing, and find, find a way to make it fit the best. So we'd move this over here shift it up, shift it down, shift it forward, shift it back until it makes the best match of the pluses and minuses and O's and so forth. And then we call that DOC. Uh, and again, this is a rigid approach. And of course, we know molecules aren't rigid. We know the receptors aren't rigid. So the other approaches, which are more complicated, add flexibility, among other features. So the lessons of docking are that it's it's, it's pretty easy to find possible poses for, for a ligand in a docking site. It's a geometry problem, and you can always solve it exhaustively. If you try every possibility, you will always, well, one of those will be the right one. But you want to do this in a rapid and reliable way. You don't want to, you don't want to find and score confirmations that aren't likely to be any value. You might as well throw those away as quickly as possible. You also have to make sure that if you're not sampling everything, that, you're, that you are sampling the true pose. And we have to pay attention to the fact that we're not just ranking the poses at the end. We also need to have some decision support that goes on as part of the process. We don't want to have to score 10, 10 billion possibilities at the end. We want, to, we want to throw away the ones as quickly and easily as possible that aren't going to make it to, the, to being uh, an an, a correct answer. So the scoring functions that we have have to balance speed, which so that we can uh, do it rapidly, as well as their accuracy. So uh, in scoring functions, we map a rather abstract concept, which is the measure of a binding force, to a numeric value. And the whole point of this is to rank one ligand's pose to another. We can apply scoring functions in multiple ways, uh, but the two ways that are most important are during pose generation where the more approximate methods and algorithms may be good enough. We don't need to determine to this fifth decimal place 
something that isn't going to work. We just want to, we want to determine does it have a chance? If it doesn't, let's throw it away. And at the end, we want to, we want to evaluate the final poses, the ones that we've passed through our filters. And here we're more interested in accuracy. But we have to, again, pay attention to how many we, we have to score. If we're going to score five or six, accuracy is problem, accuracy at high level is worthwhile. But for scoring five million, that's not worthwhile. So in terms of building a scoring function, there's one equation we have to pay attention to. And that is, that's Gibbs free energy. We always have to pay attention to whether or not a, a scoring function gives us a free energy value, because that's the currency of, of interactions. So there's a variety of classes and uh, of functions that are available. There's force field methods, which are using, again, Newtonian molecular mechanics like we talked about before. There are semi-empirical methods where uh, we add terms from observation. For example, a commonly used one is the hydrophobic contact surface area. We simulate hydrophobics by seeing how much hydrophobic hydrophobic contact there is between the receptor and the, uh, the compound binding. There are methods that are wholly empirical, uh, and that's sort of like the QSAR approach. We have training sets and we derive descriptors in order to develop a, a empirical methods. And there are knowledge-based methods. And this uses a potential means force, potentials of mean force approach that we take known structures, for example, uh, crystal structures of known protein ligand complexes, and develop rule sets of, of how often does a carbon oxygen bond approach a hydrophobic group or those sorts of things. And we can develop these rule sets and that gives us another approach to calculate methods. And I point out again that our, our chapter in Berger has a detailed description of scoring functions. But there's some lessons that come out of all this and I, again, I, there's much that can be said about this. Uh, there's some trade-offs. The first trade-off is speed versus accuracy. It's a classic example of how you want two things at the same time and you can't really have them. You can't be infinitely fast and infinitely accurate. It just is not going to happen. Uh, we can keep trying, and people do, but it's, it's just not going to happen. You've got you've to determine where on the continuum between speed and accuracy you need to be. If you need to be really accurate, you're going to have to be willing to accept the fact that it's going to take a long time to score it. And if you need to be really, really fast, you have to accept the fact that it's not going to be the most accurate method. Another trade-off, again involving accuracy, is generality versus accuracy. If you want a universally applicable function that will work on every possible type of protein ligand complex that exists, it's not going to be that accurate as one that you created and calibrated for the problem at hand. So if you want to look at, if you want to look at HIV-1 protease and ligands bound to HIV-1, you create, a, you, create a, you create or calibrate a, a scoring function that works for that, not expect one that was calibrated on some other protein to work as well. And the third thing that comes out of this is that most scoring functions available commercially are calibrated to reproduce the crystallographic structure of the complex. They calibrate them so that you can, it will recreate uh, a known crystallographic structure. And it's not calibrated to, to uh, reproduce accurately the free energy of binding. So even though it's, it seems intuitive that if you get the crystallographic structure right, you should get the energy right, it doesn't always work that way. And you can find many, uh, many scoring functions give very poor predictions of binding, but they do reproduce crystal structures. Okay, and now I want to say a little bit about the hydrophobic effect, water, and drug discovery and design that exploits water. Uh, I'm partly because uh, we've recently uh, uh, written a perspective for journal medicinal chemistry on this, but also I think this is the last thing we really need to look at and think about. The hydrophobic effect is a very major driving force in protein structure and ligand binding. In fact, it might be the most important force 
in these things because the water is everywhere and it's influencing all interactions even when you are thinking that it's not. So the hydrophobic effect seems to be a lot like a van der Waals interaction. In fact, some people say, oh, well, the van der Waals, van der Waals term will take care of the hydrophobics. And, and of course, that's enthalpic. But it isn't always what it seems because there are other things going on. You have to go back to remember what the origin of the hydrophobic effect. It's more related to the rearrangements of water and their, and their possible motion than it is to an attraction. Each, each water in a biological system seeks to form better hydrogen bonds with other waters and polar species. So it actually turns out the hydrophobic effect is entropic, not enthalpic. So just a simple cartoon to represent this. On the left uh, is uh, just a collection of water molecules. Remember that uh, liquid water, the average, each water is on average bound to uh, two other waters. So it making, it's making, uh, or three other waters, I'm sorry, making three hydrogen bonds. Some are making four, some are making two, but on average in liquid water, it's about th three. Uh, when a molecule, is present within uh, within a, a water and in, in dissolve. For example, this molecule here, uh, the wa the hydrogen binding of the water to that molecule and the, the functional groups of that water uh, are incorporated and, and make it fit in. Now, this particular molecule has a has a methylene group in it, and nothing is hydrogen binding to that. But because this particular molecule is making quite a few interactions with water it is pretty fully soluble there. Now, let's change up a little bit. Now we have two very hydrophobic molecules that are, are in the water. Uh, they are caged by the water. The water is not uh, trying to interact with them. It's trying to get away from them. And it sort of encapsulates them by uh, turning away as much as it can to create a pocket. And this is actually the hydrophobic effect, because water and oil don't mix, just like just like your mother told you. And uh, the small, even on a micro scale, this oily molecule does not want to be solubilized in water. So what water will do in order to to improve its situation is it will push away from the from this. Uh, these two, these two uh, hydrophobic molecules, as shown by the purple arrows, which has a tendency to, to look like the, the two green molecules are approaching each other to create something like this. So that's the hydrophobic effect. There's, there appears to be a hydrophobic attraction between these two hydrophobic molecules, but in fact, it's, it's not really there. It's the fact that the water molecules didn't want to be associated with it that makes it appear as, there's, as though there's a hydrophobic interaction. So um, one uh, thing comes out of water is how useful is it in drug discovery and drug design. So I'm going to just briefly present two scenarios. One is a drug discovery scenario. So is in drug discovery, we're talking about finding a new molecule to fit into a space that didn't have a drug type molecule in it before. So if, that, if there's some water molecules that are isolated in hydrophobic pockets, They'll, it won't very, that water molecule will not very, make very many interactions because it doesn't have anything to interact with, just like before, just like in the previous slide. So this is probably a very highly entropic situation. And that kind of water will be very easily displaced to bulk. It's going to go into the bulk of the water with, the, with, with, its, uh, with its other water molecules, its friends, and it will uh, create new... Uh, new hydrogen bonds, and also uh, become less entropic. So these new interactions are going to be enthalpically favorable, but this creates a loss of entropy because it was entropic when it was sitting here in the hydrophobic pocket, now it's not. But if the water is part of a cluster that has a variety of interwater interactions, it becomes a little more difficult to figure out what's going on. So if the cluster has interwater interactions, then it's more enthalpically favored and there's less entropy. 
and also when we push that water molecule out, then the gain entropy will not be as not be as as large, and that's what's shown here. So we, on the right we have our a collection of three water molecules that are in a po in a hydrophobic pocket. The green here represents just the fact that it's hydrophobic. The red are hydrogen bond donors, the blue are hydrogen bond acceptors. There's three water molecules being around here. And some of them, they're interacting with each, with each other. This, these two are, this one might not be, but they're in motion. That's represented by the little arrows. And if we're gonna occupy this space with a drug type molecule, probably one that's pretty hydrophobic, we want these water molecules to, to come out of there and join in with the bulk. So is this an enthalpic or entropic process? Well, it's a little bit of both, and it's a little confusing exactly what is, whether it's mostly enthalpic or mostly entropic. So another scenario, this is a drug design scenario. It's an optimization scenario. In this case, we have, we have a molecule already uh, that's in our, in our, in our uh, active site, but we want to improve it and we maybe are nearby a water molecule that could possibly, uh, uh, po if we could displace it, we could possibly improve our, 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 our binding of our compound. So if it's in a tightly bound water, if it's, the water is tightly bound in a polar pocket, it's going to be really hard to get out. It's enthalpically favored where it is, and when we displace it, the bulk, it's not going to increase in entropy very much, if at all. So uh, the only way we're going to get much energy, energy out of this is if we can find a large entropic gain. So we might get some by displacing it to bulk, but it's, it's, it's not going to be very much. Probably our, our most likely result is that it's less enthalpically favorable to be in bulk. However, if the water is less locked in place, it has a more, much more complicated energetic profile. Both the enthalpy and entropy could be affected either favorably or unfavorably by its displacement. So this is a, a little bit of a scenario here. This is a, a very famous uh, case of HIV-1 protease. Uh, this is the HIV-1 protease in the, in the unbound form. Uh, there are a number of water molecules in the active site and they're labeled in different ways. Uh, water 300 sits here between the two uh, the two aspartates, and it's the it's at the catalytic center. And that one that one's got to go. Uh, 313 and 313 bis, and the and the primes over here on the other side are the same. Are uh, going to stick around because they help support the the binding of the of the ligand. These waters that are labeled in red uh, letters A B C D up to G, those are going to be bumped out because they're just hysterically in the wrong place. And lastly, there's water 301, which sticks down here at the bottom. It's got a blue label on it because it actually is very stable where it is. So the first class of molecules that were developed looks something like this. And they, as I said, bumped out water 300, bumped out all the, the lettered, uh, the lettered uh, uh, water molecules, which were hysterically in the, in the way. It kept water 301 because that's very energ energetically favored. And the 313 and 313 bis mo water molecules were support the interaction because they bridge between the, the ligand molecule and the protein. Now, a lot of people said, okay, let's see if we can make 301 disappear. Because if we make 301 disappear, we will get energy because of its, en because of its entropic release and we'll, get, we'll gain the energy of making new hydrogen bonds. So the second generation of HIV-1 protease inhibitors did just that. They found a way to replace the water with uh, functional groups that were able to, to, uh, to bind to the isoleucines, and uh, they were found to be uh, somewhat more effective than the, than the ones that didn't have that. However, if you counted the energy of the water in the previous case, where there was water 301 there, it worked, worked out to essentially a wash. Okay, I'm going to talk about one more thing here, uh, enthalpy entropy compensation. 
uh, and this is this is one thing that makes uh, drug design very frustrating is that water often plays a role in enthalpy uh, enthalpy entropy compensation by mitigating the effects of structural changes that were designed to optimize the drug's binding. So in the top case here, we have a molecule that's got a methyl group here, and we are trying to uh, optimize it. We say we see that if we can put a uh, something over here that will bind with this polar region in red here, maybe an OH group, we would improve the binding of this molecule, and we would have a a a, a, a better binding constant for our molecule. So uh, if we do that, as shown here, uh, look what happens. Well, we do get better enthalpy for sure because it is um, making a new hydrogen bond that we didn't have before. But on the other hand, we're losing some entropy, internal entropy we had, be we had before. So this is, more, this is more entropically favored. This is more enthalpically favored. So a change gives us the desired uh, increase uh, decrease in enthalpy, but also reduces entropy, so that the change in free energy, delta delta G, is approximately zero. Now, in the bottom case, uh, the decision was made, okay, let's see if we can, uh, let's see if we can, we got a hydrophobic group here, if we can maybe push this water molecule out, we would get a, we would get a better binding, uh, a better binding compound uh, like this. So we added a methyl group here and pushed this water molecule out here and we were interested to see if this would be a better would be a better uh, a better uh, a better energetic profile well we did unfortunately uh, increase the 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 enthalpy but we also increased the entropy and again our delta delta G is around zero so the enthalpy entropy compensation is an important factor that needs to be considered in uh, drug design, and there's many frustrating examples in the literature on that. So uh, I'm going to finish up here. Uh, these are the main points uh, out of this talk. I, I think I tried to show you that the computational tools are powerful, powerful adjuncts to experiment, but their underlying principles and limitations must be understood if the users can be truly effective using them. Too many people treat uh, computational tools as black boxes. They don't go to the trouble of understanding how they work. So I tried to go through a little bit about the, the physics and chemistry behind these things. I certainly didn't have enough time to go into a lot of detail on that, but maybe uh, you'll have an appreciation for how it works and you'll be cautious. One of the things that we emphasize in our and our courses that we teach to our students at VCU is that you have to always question uh, computational results. The computational results do not ever, ever give you an answer, but their supporting evidence can be useful. And sometimes the most useful thing that comes out of that is it gives you visualization. You can actually see the sort of things that you are, are trying to achieve and see why or why not it might work or might not work. Uh, in my view, the best computational experiments are those that suggest great wet experiments. If we, through our computational work, give someone an idea to create an experiment that answers a question because they s saw through visualization or whatever, uh, what might happen, that's a real success for us. I try to point out that QSAR is the QSAR is the keystone principle that has enabled many more modern tools like virtual screening, docking, scoring, etc. because it, it's all based on the simple principle that the activity is a function of structure. Always when you're looking at any kind of thing where you're calculating scores or calculating energies, Gibbs free energy is the currency. You need to pay attention to Gibbs free energy, pay attention to both the enthalpy and the entropy. The accurate estimates of delta G require consideration of everything, especially the water molecules and the roles. So I'd like to uh, thank uh, NIH for inviting me to give this presentation. I invite uh, students who take this course to write me if they have questions or contact the 
the co the uh, the coordinator of the of the course and uh, and thank you for your attention. Good night.